Um, thank you for coming and for inviting me here. Um, I really enjoyed my stay here. Please let me know if I'm not speaking loud enough, if you can't see the blackboard, and feel free to ask any questions. So the topic for today are common systems of equations or common linear patterns. And I'll be presenting some joint results with Anita Liebenau and Natasha Morrison. So our starting point are classical statements in Ramsey theory. So the question is, for instance, for short triples, your universe are integers of, from one up to n. And the question is, is there a two coloring uh, with no monochromatic short triples? So no uh, short triples where x, y, z are all red or all blue. And the answer is no, uh, even for n equals nine or something. Uh, but usually, you know, you ask about more colors and then it's also no for sufficiently large n. And uh, there are many other statements of this type. So for instance, Van der Veen's theorem says that uh, in your universe one up to n, you cannot avoid a monochromatic k-term arithmetic progression. So KAP will just stand for k-term arithmetic progression for me. And then for graphs, uh, the classical theorem of Ramsey, which has been in the spotlight in the last couple of weeks, says that uh, you cannot avoid in a complete graph, um, you cannot avoid a monochromatic. Okay, so now um, we think of n as going to infinity, so growing, and then, okay, so you can't avoid, say, a short triple, but what you might ask is, can I minimize the number of monochromatic solutions? And that's the question that we'll be dealing with today. So this was first asked for uh, short triples by uh, Graham, Rödel, and Ruchinsky. So what is the minimal number? Or more naturally, maybe the minimal density of short triples, because you always just um, care. So you let n tend to infinity. So all our statements are symptomatic, and you care about the minimal density. But let's write number here of monochromatic, I must write SDs for short triples uh, in two colorings of the interval one up to n as n times infinity. And this was all in the 90s. So this was answered uh, in three independent papers. So the answer is n squared over 22. Asymptotically, so this is again, as n tends to infinity. Um, and so again, three independent papers. While I write the names, uh, let me just remark that um, here, it's crucial that you're working in the interval one up to n, so there is no wrapping around, you're not, not in a, an abelian group. So you have these edge effects, and they're actually crucial for the question and for the solution. So this was Vatsovsky, uh, Robertson Salberg. and turn independently. Okay. So in general, uh, this question, so for, for general, you may ask instead of short triples for arbitrary linear patterns, and this question is difficult, um, but what we'll do is two things. First of all, we'll work in a group from now on in an abelian group. So that makes the um, uh, questions somewhat simpler, but you can also ask more general questions. And secondly, uh, we'll ask, when is the random coloring optimal? When is... As, um, faced with this question, you have two things to do. You have to construct colorings with few monochromatic copies, and you have to prove that you can always find such copies. And of course, for the, the lower side, uh, a natural thing to attempt is a random coloring, especially if 
you work usually with graphs and then not numbers, so you don't really know what to do with numbers, you just try random coloring. So then for short triples, you know, random red blue, co blue coloring, each triple will be monochromatic with probability roughly or exactly one quarter. So you have three components and you have probability one eighth that it's red, one eighth that it's blue, so altogether one quarter. And you may ask, when is this optimal? So this uh, turns out to be optimal for short triples, feature arithmetic progressions, and a whole class of things. So I'll write that now. So this was an observation um, by Cameron, Sigueruelo, and Serra. So in, in any abelian group G, um, any red blue coloring contains at least a quarter of monochromatic short triples asymptotically. Actually, now I'm not sure. I think this is even exact, but I'll write a little of one as, and then Stimpen is just in case. I think there might be some lower order terms. Um, so, and again, what we care about is this proportion, one quarter. We don't care about the G squared. So for the rest of the talk, I'll just talk about the density of solutions. Okay, uh, so this means, that for short triples, random is optimal. In GQ. Uh, no, short triples. So X and Y are arbitrary, and then Z is uh, uh, determined by that. Thanks. So random is optimal. Yeah, and this extends to, for instance, three term arithmetic progression. So this is a nice cancellation argument. Hint inclusion exclusion, um, and actually it extends to any any equations with an odd number of variables. Okay, and here I'm actually cheating a little bit because. Um, by saying random is optimal because I, there's actually a whole host of optimal colorings. So for this specific equations, it's maybe not the most interesting to look at random colorings, but nevertheless, um, the, the question brings about um, interesting results, which I'll try and convince you today. So in this talk, we'll be working in the finite field model. So in FQ to the the end. So let me then define the model and define exactly what I mean by this random is optimal. For finite fields, can you say a couple of words about this one over 22? Uh, where the, ah, uh, yes. Is it what it comes from, from double counting monochromatic triangles and Goodman's formula and the proof of Schur's theorem? Not it's really. So this one is very similar to Goodman's theorem. So this cancellation thing. Um, and uh, there's a whole parallel stream for graphs, so I'll mention that. Uh, this one is a little bit more complicated, exactly because of the wrapping around. So uh, a natural thing, if you want to minimize the number of short ripples, then you take the middle interval, and that has no short ripples. And now, but the edges will now contain many short ripples. So what you do is basically optimize the, the size of your interval so that it's not obvious at all. But I think you do something like red is uh, 4n over 11, uh, 10n over 11, something like this. Uh, so this is red and the complement is blue. So by the way, Whenever I say coloring, you, you can just think set and its complement, and I'll use that terminology later. So the finite field model. Uh, 
So we consider equations, um, we, we consider coefficients a1 up to ak in a finite field. So q can be a prime or a prime power, maybe for today, you just think, can just think of it as prime. And um, and the solutions will live in FQ to the end. So in the vector space, uh, FQ, I mean, each, each component of the solution will, will live in uh, FQ to the end. So the equation, a1, x1 plus ak, xk equals zero, and all my uh, equations will be homogeneous, is common if um, the density of monochromatic solutions solutions in any two coloring of FQ to the N. So this is now important, um, well, somewhat important, I'll mention that, is at least two to the one minus K. Let me just check that the sentence I wrote makes sense. Okay, good. So feel free to ask any questions um, about this in case I forget to comment on something. But okay, so first of all, our universe. So x1 is a vector in fq to the end, and so is a, a so are all of these solutions. So you can think of the full solution as a matrix. Uh, K by N matrix, uh, but the coefficients are just in FQ. Um, the density, so the benchmark that we choose is two to the, so we're coloring points of this vector space and the expected density of monochromatic solutions in a random set is this two to the one minus K. So this is what we, often referred to as the random benchmark. So this means that in particular, there's always, there always exists a coloring with um, at most this many monochromatic short triples. And again, this is by looking at any specific solution x1 up to xk, and um, the probability that it will be monochromatic is roughly this, and I suspect your question. Right. Think of k is fixed and n going to infinity. Exactly, uh, k is fixed and n is always going to infinity. And just so you don't get confused, so I cheated a little bit here when it comes to expected uh, proportional solutions because you might have some solutions with repeated coordinates, and then uh, those solutions come in with a higher probability. But that's a little of a uh, little of one term, and that's one reason why it's convenient to have this n tending to infinity because if your universe is large, then fewer solutions will have, like a vanishing proportion of solutions will have uh, repeated coordinates. And this finite field model, well, it's just in general an interesting object to work with in arithmetic uh, combinatorics and it makes many things easier, such as counting solutions. And you have this natural notion of n tending to infinity. So specifically, if for n equals one, you have some specific coloring, then that coloring naturally gives you uh, coloring for any larger n. So there is some monotonicity there. Um, and actually for us, I won't mention this, but for us, um, one reason it's convenient to work in this group is that um, we actually work with a linear relaxation of this problem. So instead of looking at colorings and sets, um, we look at functions from here to, z to the interval 0, 1, and that problem turns out to be uh, equivalent to the coloring problem by some rounding tricks or random sampling tricks. So this is fairly standard, but I 
I won't refer to it anymore. So for the purpose of this talk, I'll just talk about colorings. Uh, are there any uh, questions on this definition? Okay, so in short, uh, a system is common if any coloring has, if the solutions are actually common in any coloring. So this kind of a play of words and it's why the title is um, maybe an oxymoron because actually it's the solutions are common. Okay, so motivation. So this was motivated uh, by some initial examples such as these um, and by equivalent problems for graphs. So for graphs, actually this was first studied. So n tends to infinity, you look at, for instance, the, the pro proportion of monochromatic triangles. And this is Goodman's theorem. Um, and then and triangles are common by Goodman's theorem. And now Erdős actually conjectured that uh, this extends to all cliques, so that all cliques are common. Um, and this was only disproved maybe 20 years ago by Thomason. So Thomason actually showed that uh, K4 is not common for, um, for graphs. And the characterization is a kind of big line of research in, in graph theory. Um, and then you can ask the same natural questions for um, arithmetic progressions. And another reason that it's interesting for graphs is that the lower bound is, has, still hasn't changed. So the lower bound for graphs is still, um, for the Ramsey number, still comes from a random construction. So in terms of minimizing this n, random is still the best thing we can do. Um, okay. And if you're still not uh, convinced that this is interesting, then I hope that this very nice result of Fox, Pham, and Zhao will, will change your mind. So theorem one, Fox, Pham, Zhao, just warning you know this board does not go up. Yeah. This, is a this one. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks. So this is okay. All right. Fox Fam and Zhao. Zhao and actually should have written apologies. Um Sad Wolf first. Because Sad and Wolf were the first to study this. Um, uh, this notion of uh, commonness more systematically. So we have exactly for a single equation, we have exactly a characterization of common equations. So <clears throat> for even k, for even k, uh, common equations are exactly Those of form A1x1 minus A1x1 prime. So the coefficients come in inverse pairs, so additive inverse pairs. For some for some a1 up to a, a, a k in uh, fq, and my coefficients will always be non-zero, just avoiding trivialities. So in other words, um, <coughs> this thing is common, and this was shown by Sad and Wolf, and the converse also holds. So if <coughs> you're common, then your coefficients have to come in these in inverse pairs. So I'll define this somewhat not didactically. Um, so these are called uh, equations with matchable coefficients. With matchable coefficients, meaning that you can reorder the coefficients in a way that they come in inverse pairs. So later, if I have time, I will um, 
try and uh, hand wave the proof of this theorem because it comes from a very nice argument. So the main idea of Coxlam and Zhao is uh, to uh, choose such a coloring uh, from its Fourier coefficients. So these solutions are con controlled by the Fourier coefficients of your coloring, but you can also go the other way around. So you can choose your uh, Fourier coefficients to get a coloring and actually they do this randomly. So they find some random choice of Fourier coefficients. Of course, it cannot be uniform random because then by definition, you have the expected number of colorings. But anyway, they, they, show, uh, they choose um, Fourier coefficients at random, and they get a coloring out of that. Do you still, in this formulation, you still need k to be even? Or oh, yes. Sorry, I forgot. Yeah, yeah, I forgot to comment on that. So uh, odd k is also resolved. So for odd k, uh, this is hard. <laughs> Uh, all equations, uh, all equations are common by this um, cancelling trick of of uh, Cameron, Cirillo, and Sarah. So for k odd, we just have a complete characterization. Uh, characterization, they're all common. Um, and for even k, then this thing completes the characterization. Should your equation have k over two? Yeah, then k is k over two. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah. Okay, exactly. Yeah. Sorry. This is a good point. For every day. And yeah, that's all I'm going to say about that. And again, <coughs> later, if time, I'll sketch some ideas for this proof. But then um, a natural follow up question, which they also asked, is characterizing systems of equations. So, for instance, k term arithmetic progressions are described by a system of linear equations. And now is, is this system common? So let me first define again what I mean by the system. And um, yeah, uh, maybe I'll go here. Yeah, maybe I'll first define the system and the and commonness and then these are results. So systems of equations. So a system will just be described by some linear form, L x, x equals zero. So L will be a matrix, L is Q. So a matrix with coefficients um, in FQ, so this is A11, et cetera. And um, x will again be a vector, maybe like this, xk. But again, all the elements of this vector, or like each component, will live in the vector space fq to the n. Okay. So it's completely the same as for the single equation. And now the definition also extends straightforwardly. So I will just recycle this definition. And in which color? So instead of equation, I'll just write system. L of x is zero is common if the density of monochromatic solutions is at least two to the one minus k. And this random benchmark hasn't changed because my solution still has uh, k components. So each component will be monochromatic with uh, probability two to the one minus k. Okay, so faced with the question of commonness for systems of equations, maybe the most natural thing to ask for first is uh, k-term arithmetic progressions. So we've seen from this that three-term arithmetic progressions are common, uh, but actually four-term arithmetic progressions are not common. So, so Wolf, this was first proved by Wolf, 
formally, but this kind of thing has been studied before. Um, so for APs are not common or uncommon um, in Zn. So it's a different, it's a different group, different model, but still morally they're not common. And uh, this kind of parallels the situation for graphs where K3 is common and K4, etc., are not common. And uh, here people also studied the question of minimizing the number of solutions, and it's really not easy. So it's actually hard to get sig significantly lower than this uh, one over eight. So for AEPs, it's one over eight. Uh, this initial example of Julia Wolf uh, does improves by maybe 10 to the minus six. And later on, this was improved by Lu and Peng. And there are also some lower bounds, but the, the lower bounds are tiny. OK. And then you might ask the same for k-term arithmetic progressions. And notice that there is no monotonicity here. So if you, for instance, have a k-term arithmetic progression, so for instance, I don't know, seven-term arithmetic progression, your matrix looks like this. And this contains, so this is a four term arithmetic progression that's kind of contained inside this, but it's not obvious that uh, now this is uncommon because you may find colorings which have too few solutions to this, so too few four term arithmetic progressions, but you can't say anything obvious about seven term arithmetic progressions. So this is what we proved. So we proved that all uh, longer arithmetic progressions are uncommon. And we actually prove um, much more general uh, necessary condition for commonness. So it turns out that whenever you see this kind of thing in your matrix, it's uncommon. So this doesn't have to be a long k-term arithmetic progression or anything like that. It just as soon as you see, uh, you have some set of variables. So some set of four variables like this, where in here you have zeros. And up here you have anything, then that thing is uncommon. So here, okay. this was um, with Liebenau and Morrison. <coughs> um, if L contains or implies a four-term arithmetic progression, then L is uncommon. Okay. So I haven't defined what it means to contain here. Um, formally, um, but I kind of drew it here. So let me know if that's unclear. Okay. And we actually proved the more general result. So K4 has specific coefficients here, but you may ask, well, what's special about these coefficients? So geometrically, a K4 is a K4, sorry, four term arithmetic progression is a, um, four equally sp spaced points on a line. And you might ask, is it the coefficients, the geometry that governs this, or uh, do any systems um, have this property? And it turns out that here, as long as you have two equations and four variables, you can put in any coefficients and uh, you're uncommon. So actually, so 2a, L contains, some, I'll just write um, in, term, in matrix form, so A, B, C, D, and zero, B prime, C prime, D prime, then L is uncommon. Okay. 
So uh, let, let me remark that this statement, so for four-term arithmetic progression, this, this was also for containing four-term arithmetic progression, this was also shown by Feshtegen, and his, um, his result extends to all abelian groups. So he has um, more general results there. And we show it for any coefficients here. So uh, yeah. all the variables are non-zero? All the coefficients here, all the, all the coefficients uh, things. So it doesn't actually matter. So they can even be zero. So perhaps it's more important that here maybe you wouldn't have, because otherwise you would have a two variable equation, but it's actually true even for two variable equations. Um, so maybe it's easiest to think of non-zero, but it's true in general. Yeah, so just especially in this one, maybe it's easier to think of um, non-zero coefficients because then you have a two-dimensional solution space. Yeah. But the zero is important? The Sorry? The zero on the second row is important? The, the zero is important, but you can get it by Gaussian elimination. So right. if you have here some A prime, you, you just eliminate it. So, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that's kind of, that's one of our main results. And um, I'll just say a few ideas for the proofs um, because another, another reason that this is interesting is that the colorings are pseudo-random. Pseudo-random in the sense that they have um, vanishing Fourier coefficients. There should be some kind of hypothesis there, right? Because for by Gaussian elimination, you should always be able to get that. If you if all the coefficients there are completely free, right? Uh, so you should put some uh, hypothesis there. No, I think so. I, I, I think not. <laughs> but yeah, okay, let's let's discuss what this means. So if L itself, so if the big system, L can be any big system, <laughs> if L itself. Uh -huh. I think I know what you mean. Okay. Uh, so L, if L is equal to this, then it's uncommon. So this is already new. Okay. It was already not known when, when L is just this. Now when L contains this, I think the crucial piece of information that we're missing is that uh, here in the rest of the equations, you, can, you, you need all zeros. So you cannot always get this by Gaussian elimination. You can only get this if your solution space is two dimensional. So not, not only, but one generic case. So one, one generic case that's resolved by this theorem is when, when your solution space is two dimensional, like in case of long arithmetic progressions, then you can get this kind of thing by Gaussian elimination. So when you say contains is really on the bottom, right? So yeah, yeah. So better maybe like linear, like geometric way to think about it is that you have some four variables which are constrained. Yeah, you have some four variables which are constrained by these two equations, but on other variables you can have anything you want. Okay. Okay. And, and another question, like if L was just all zero, then it would be common. So if L was just all zero. Yeah, but that, yeah, that kind of depends on your definitions. Uh, but I guess, yeah, because anything is a solution. You could probably say anything is a solution. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's everything here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, this result. So, how does one prove this? So, again, first step is showing that just this, so if L is equal to this, that this is uncommon. And this was already not known, and this is an elementary construction, but it's not easy. So even for four APs, um, this was not known for general Q, so for general field size. Um, so yeah, it's a hands-on construction, uh, but an interesting thing about it is that, again, it doesn't use geometry, so it just uses gen linear algebra. So in additive combinatorics, when people want to avoid four APs, what they usually do is, you know, take some structured set, like, like an interval and play with that. But this thing actually just relies on, on linear algebra. And this, the consequence of that is that the same coloring works for all such systems. So it's the same coloring regardless of the conditions. And that's kind of important for the second step of the proof. So 
the, for the second step of the proof, you get um, something that's bad, as in has too few solutions uh, for, for all such systems. And then as a kind of almost black box, you can massage it and get a following that's also bad for the entire matrix. And as part of that, so as part of that second step, we needed to make our coloring pseudo random. Um, so this pseudo randomness comes from basically we had to kill contributions of some single equations. And um, there we use some, some tricks of flowers and green because basically people were interested independently in these pseudo random colorings because uh, um, it's a well known and unfortunate fact in um, ethnic combinatorics that Fourier coefficients do not control these. And they do not control four term arithmetic progressions. And it's easy to construct uh, sets with small Fourier coefficients, so pseudo random sets, which contain too many of these. So, in general, getting too many solutions is not a problem. Um, however, it's not so easy to construct um, colorings with, um, which are pseudo random and have too few solutions. And this is done, this is some machinery developed by Gowers and Green, and this is what we do here to make our coloring pseudo random. So that's all I'm going to say about that theorem, um, but there's also another, um, another theorem that uh, is more general. So here we have systems of any size, but the solution space is two-dimensional. And the, the statement I'm going to say is actually valid for whenever you have here an even equation. So an equation with an even number of variables. And uh, I want to say a little bit more about that statement because um, there's a more potential for extending that, I think. So theorem three. I'll just write some words that I haven't defined and, and then I'll define them. So this is also KLM. So we have some system. System. Um, with even girth. So this means really you hear the shortest equation is even. So if all critical equations, which will be these shortest equations, critical equations have non-matchable coefficients, coefficients, then the system is uncommon. Is uncommon. Okay, so it the, this statement um, tells you that the system is uncommon under certain assumptions on the girth and the so-called critical equation. So I'll explain what these are, but the moral is that uh, if you understand single equations, then you can say something quite general about the system. So here are already examples. So. Maybe I'll use this small space. So the girth G of L is the number of variables, which I sometimes call length, in the shortest. Uh, equation contained in L. In L. L. So, in other words, you do Gaussian elimination of L on L, and you try and eliminate as many variables as you possibly can. And if in here you get an equation of uh, certain length, then that's your girth. And here we're interested in the case of even girth. Okay. 
So, for example, what's the girth of four uh, eighths? Sorry. What's the girth of the equation for defining a four trimmer type regression? Uh, so the girth is three. Yeah, because you, you can find the constraint. So it's basically the smallest number of constrained variables. Um, yeah. But uh, so the the even girth assumption is uh, important. So it's not an artifact of the solution. It's just that things behave differently. Well, and even and here I'll define critical equations. So C of L is the set of critical equations. Is C of L? The so the, these are the so-called critical equations, um, and these are the equations. On S of L va uh, variables or G of L, G of L, G of L variables contained in L, contained in L. I'll give uh, some examples in a second, but basically, you have certain sets of variables that actually attain this girth, and when you collect all of these sets of variables, you get your critical equations. So here are some examples that I wrote out because I really don't want to do both proportion elimination here. So our first example, maybe I'll do it here. Oops, no, it doesn't work. So the first, the first equation is this. Um, so it has six variables. And it has in it, uh, so you can deduce some equation on four variables. And you can check that this is minimal in this case. So these four variables are minimal. Um, and this is a unique such equation. So this will be the unique critical equation for this system L1. So uh, how do you check this? Well, if you try and so here are some zeros. And if you try and eliminate any other variables, so say if you try to eliminate this one, you end up with an equation of five variables. And this is also true for any other variable you try to eliminate. You can see this by looking at two by two matrices. So um, yeah, this is the only thing you can do if you want to attain four variables. So that's your critical equation. And this theorem three, so this has, G, this is girth four. It has a single critical equation. This equation does not have matchable coefficients, so they don't come in inverse pairs. So then um, theorem three implies that this is uncommon. And here I'm just writing two equations as examples, but again, this, this holds for any system of any size. Another example is um, here L2. So this is more the kind of example that you would like to give your to undergrads. So if you give them this, they'll get confused, but this system is more generic in the sense that whatever variable you try and eliminate, you end up with four, um, with four non-zero coefficients. So this thing actually has girth four and it has five critical equations um, depending on the variable you want to eliminate and I haven't written them out, but they're all non-matchable, you can check. And then this is also uncommon by theorem three. Oh, oops. So, A uh, kind of more unclear example is this um, third one, where it's the same kind of generic form. So you get five different um, equations depending on which variables you eliminate here. But actually, some of these are now common. So some of them have matchable coefficients. So this one, this one, this one, they all have matchable coefficients. And these two don't have. 
So now it's kind of unclear which, which of these equations win. So I'll go back to this example later in the concluding remarks, but actually maybe spoiler. So this system turns out to be common. So just in case you were starting to think that everything is uncommon, there's actually some interesting phenomena going on, but we don't know how to really characterize these things. So these are common. And a fourth example <laughs> is another kind of mixed example. Yeah, I'll go back to this in the concluding remarks. But anyway, I hope you understand uh, this notion of critical equations. So the moral is that it's not hard to get them just by uh, raw manipulations. And then you can just check from the coefficients of these critical equations that your system is uncommon. And um, the nice thing here is that nothing in the statement um, depends on how the solutions of these critical equations extend. So if you want to solve this system, you start by solving the critical equation and extending that. Um, so extending that to x1, but it doesn't really matter what this x1 is, how it extends, all you care about is these coefficients. And this theorem three actually relies on a more general uh, black box result that we can use as a, as a commonness, um, as a criterion for uncommonness. So you might wonder correctly, is it really necessary to have all critical equations uh, have non-matchable coefficients? And the answer is, well, no, it's not but this is the case that we know how to analyze. So I'll write a statement and then if you know how to analyze these um, single equations, um, you can get more consequences out of that. So for this statement, I need another piece of notation. Maybe I'll write this here. So we, have, we still have our system L and and we have a specific coloring, which for me will just be the red set. So I specify the red set and the blue set is complement. complement. And uh, we denote by a lambda L of A. Lambda L of A is the, the density that we actually care about. So is the density of, of solutions to L in A or in A complement. So again, when I say in A, I mean really all components in A. So that's the density uh -huh. minus the random benchmark, sorry. Minus the random benchmark, uh, minus two to the one minus K. So then we can just reformulate our definition as um, L is uncommon. So this is our formulation. L is un uh, uncommon if and only if there is some coloring A such that lambda L of A is less than zero. And this is also for some N for some integer n because we're in fq to the n, but that's not hugely important. Okay, so we just need this piece of notation that counts solutions. Um, so I'll just write down the statement and that will be it. Okay. Uh, so for systems of even girth, even girth, if there exists a certificate, so we suppose that there is a certain coloring, which is bad, 
jointly for all critical equations of L. And then L is uncommon. So what does this mean? Again, we no, we no longer care about the count of solutions to L, the system. We just care about the critical equations here, the M's. And if you can make the sum, um, the sum uh, of all solutions to the critical equations negative, then you can make the whole thing negative. And um, this, when you write it out, this L is uncommon. This means that there is some A prime, in which this is negative. And this A prime is not quite the same as A, but you get it by some, some simple modifications of, um, of A. So this is a statement that's used to deduce um, the theorem on the left. Theorem three, um, and um, notice that it doesn't follow quite trivially from this result of Fox, Fam, and Zhao, because yes, there it is. Ah, I deleted it. Yeah, I deleted it. Ah. So it doesn't follow trivially from this result of Fox, Fam, and Zhao, because. Um, you need, so we do know that um, all equations with, with non-matchable coefficients are uncommon, but the theorem of Fox, Fam, and Zhao, it does not give, give you a certificate that's kind of good for all these M's simultaneously. So we need to basically redo the beautiful proof, but also add uh, some extra analysis to it. Okay, and again, the moral of this theorem is, first of all, we are able to reduce uh, understanding systems to understanding single equations. And this is particularly useful because um, these lambdas for a single equation, they're govern uh, governed by Fourier coefficients. Um, I haven't, I won't have time to discuss this, but I wrote out an equation of this type. So these things are governed by Fourier coefficients, and then you can reduce studying your system to studying some beautiful formula of this form in terms of Fourier coefficients. So that's why this is useful, because in particular, um, if you can analyze, analyze those polynomials on the left, then you can get new results from this theorem. So that's all I'm going to say about this theorem. Questions. And for the conclusion, let me just mention some further work. So we're only really scratching the surface of this uh, characterization. So there's a lot you can do. First of all, this kind of superposition tool. So I think of this as a superposition tool because you decompose in terms of different systems. It actually works for all L, not just even girth. But for all the girth, you just need to look at um, to define this object correctly. So instead of looking at critical equations, you need to look at two equations and it all works. But it's harder to use. So for odd girth, we can also say some things, but they're harder to use. Uh, however, Altman has a very nice mechanism for um, using this odd girth case. So this means that if you can understand two by six systems, so if you can understand systems on six variables, for five, like this. So if you can understand systems that look like this, then you can say something much more general about larger systems uh, containing those. Uh, and again, Leo Fresh-Tagen has some beautiful results for general abelian groups. So you can look at those if you're interested in abelian groups. And uh, recently, for F2 specifically, so the finite field of order two, uh, the, um, uh, there's a big progress in, uh, in characterizing two equation systems. So 
just going from, from this to two equations already for, uh, for F2 is really not easy, but uh, Kral, Lamaison and Bach have some, some characterization that's lacking a few, uh, like a finite number of cases. So there's also a gap to, to be filled there. And then you can also analyze uh, the corresponding Sidorenko pro property. So uh, here we deal with colorings, but you can also try and minimize the number of solutions in a single set A. And it's um, studied heavily for graphs, the so-called Sidorenko property. And there are also some results on that um, due to all of these mentioned authors. So again, a lot to do there. So thank you for listening and I'm happy to take questions now. Questions? I have a question. So is there any hope that any of this machinery applies to the graph uh, commonality problem and the Sidorenko there? Um, so the, this was part of the, the motivation. Maybe I'll repeat. So it's basically the relation in terms of methods between this and graphs. Um, this was kind of the hope that this was part of the motivation for studying this. And there is some analogy in correspondence, again, in this Sidorenko property, for instance. But um, equations are much more structured because, for instance, you can count solutions, right? If you fix, if you fix a certain, certain set of variables, you know how these extend to a larger set. And this is crucially used for uh, equations, so I have some doubts for that. Yeah. What about the, the other way around? So at, at least at work a bit screen code properly, there's all these yeah, yes. So for graphs, theorems. It's true, it's true. Yeah. So for graphs, there are many decomposition theorems that you can use they, and many, yeah. Uh, transfer yes. to the they they transfer pretty well to the arithmetics. So for instance, commonness is most often showed by Cauchy's inequality. So this thing, for instance, is common by Cauchy. But there are also these entropy methods, and actually we get some some Sidorenko results for systems of equations by using the entropy method. Oh, yeah. that's right. Oh, okay. Uh, so for any, I just misunderstood perhaps the last part there. For so for anything two-dimensional in your theorem, do you know like car variance with the minimal number of solutions, like analogous to what Schur's result is? So and if you have uncommon, do you have like, uh, do you know at least for some like higher complexity equations, what is the minimal number? So for some higher complexity equations, uh, let me see. So uh, no short answer, no, we don't. And for four APs, people have looked at this quite uh, quite a lot. So for um, for larger equations, we can, there are some common systems. And by the way, it's interesting. So all of these papers contain various interesting examples of common systems. So in that case, we know the minimum. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, I don't know any equations where they're not common and you know how to minimize solutions. <laughs> and even for single equations, I think actually it's a very interesting problem because for single equations, um, you're basically minimizing objects like this. So for single equations, you can we can write down the number of solutions as, as in terms of Fourier coefficients, and then you only need to minimize that. Um, so there's some hope of being able to minimize those. The problem is in inverting that. So once you once you have a good like setting of these a kappas um, that kind of contains a small number, you want to take that back to a. And there you may not get a sensible result. So do you have some kind of conjecture or a, at least a plausible uh, like if and only if characterization? Or? Yeah, no, for if and only if, no chance. Uh, no, yeah, but I mean, for, no chance for me. Uh, but uh, we do have some conjectures. For, so for instance, for two equations, um, so, I, and I think, but this is for the Sidorenko property. Um, so, for the Sidorenko property, uh, we conjectured that everything like this is not Sidorenko. So, basically, uh, when you have two equations, 
and you have this generic case where you don't have some accidental elimination, then um, we conjecture that this is Sidorenko, and this was shown by, by Dan Altman, I think. Uh, again, I'm losing track of all these results. But um, yeah, and, and, and we, we did post some, some general con uh, conjectures, but they mainly relate to small cases. Are there any some results for R colorings or R is not speakable? Yes, yeah, so people look at R colorings. So we don't have any results for equations yet, um, but, but people look at this a lot for graphs. So one very interesting question for me is the following. So for graphs, you know that if you're common for um, an arbitrary number of colors, an arbitrary finite number of colors, then you're also Sidorenko in the sense that any set is actually good, like the number of solutions in any set is as expected. And I think this is not known for systems of equations. So it might be, or find a counterexample. So prove or found, find a counterexample that if your system is common for any uh, number of colors, then it satisfies the Sidorenko property. I think this would be interesting. So what about this one equation? So analogous results to these uh, early results you mentioned, uh, the one with that number of variables. So huh. I guess this, these Fourier proofs uh, don't immediately extend. Yeah the, yeah, the Fourier proofs don't immediately extend because in here you get the set plus its complement, but yeah, then you don't have complements in the same way that Goodman's theorem doesn't extend to multiple colors. So it's difficult. I don't know. Uh, but Sidorenko, by the way, I didn't mention, so Sidorenko implies common for, for any number of colors. So you can always use, use Sidorenko to deduce that. I think that's the only thing I know. More questions? Let's thank me again.